Let's turn to the book of John, chapter 2. Okay? Chapter 2. Now, I'm not going to back up a whole lot and give you what I've done. Hopefully you remember uh, everything that we talked about up to this point. Who God is, and the light, and all the other aspects. I'm going to take just a little bit out of chapter 2. Now, chapter 2 basically takes in the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Now, I am going to read uh, down through some of it just to give a flavor of what's coming. And at this point, I don't know that I'm going to preach a whole lot on the changing of the water and wine and all that scripture. Maybe God will change my mind between now and next week. But uh, I do want to get it in and just give us a uh, overall of what John is leading to here. Okay. Uh, you'll, you'll remember what he's coming out of here uh, is the calling of the disciples. And we've already talked about uh, come and see, right? God, you know, the... Uh, disciples were telling others, we found the Messiah, you know, come and see, come and see. And then last week was, follow me. When they came and they saw, then Jesus says, follow me. I don't think I brought it out real well last week, I meant to, that following Jesus meant learning from what he did, allowing him to teach, but then going out and doing what he taught. And discipleship, one of the, uh, the, uh, definitions of discipling someone I heard one time was first you show them how to do it and then you watch them as they do it and then you send them out to do it on their own. And that's what Jesus did uh, throughout his ministry uh, with the disciples and the apostles. And remember we talked about what the difference was in the apostles and the disciples. Okay? Alrighty. So they're coming off of that and in chapter 2 here, John says, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Okay? Now, what do it mean to be called? They were invited. Invited to come, okay? To come to the wedding. They were invited participants. And both, yeah. And verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Hmm. Now if somebody came to you at a wedding and said they had no wine, would you feel any responsibilities? Nope, I'm a guest here. <laughs> oh, but Jesus knew exactly where Mary was coming from. You know, sometimes we wonder and we verbalize and we ask, I wonder if Mary really knew who Jesus was and what he could do, you know, before he started doing his miracles. Well, turning the water to wine was the first recorded what? Miracle. Miracle, Miracle got first recorded, okay? But whenever they came to Mary, you know, and she found out they didn't have any wine, what did she automatically do? went to Jesus. You didn't go to John or James or one of Jesus' brothers, did she? You go to one of his sisters. She went to Jesus and said, they've got no wine. And that's all she had to say, right? Because next, Jesus said unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? He's been a little smart. Now, Clint or Luke or one of the boys that said that to Yvonne, they might have got the back of the van. Okay. Woman, that, that'd be the word. That'd be, they wouldn't get past that. They called her mom a woman. You know. But still, Jesus, and I doubt he was being disrespectful, but he was good, trying to get across a point that we're going to bring out from what most of the sermon's going to be on here. Okay, he said, woman, what do I have to do? So Mary knew what Jesus could do. She knew that he could handle this idea. Now, did she know how? Probably not. But she knew that Jesus had the power and the ability to help out their friends. 
they run out of wine, and it's very embarrassing. What have I to do with thee? Now, this is the terminology. This is what's in your bulletin there as a title. Mine hour has not yet come. I'm going to come back to that, okay? His mother saith unto the servants, Whatever he saith unto you, do it. Okay? Did Mary know what Jesus could do? Sure thing. She knew her son. She knew he was God and that he was deity. Okay? And there were set there six pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear it unto the governor of the feast. Okay? So in other words, I'm going to stop right there. We don't need the rest of the content here. Jesus said, fill it with water. Now, draw it out. He didn't say draw out water. But he told them draw it out. Now, those servants, what would they have thought was in those jars? Water. Water. <laughs> but they drew it out, and they were obedient to what God told them to do. That's a good point to tie in with their message this morning. Mary was obedient. The servants were obedient. Everyone that needed to be was obedient to the Lord to do what He commanded them to do. Okay? I'm, I'm thinking is um, that they thought they 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 had wicked water. Yep, they probably thought it was water, and they were probably shaking in their boots when they took it to the uh, Lord of the Feast, and here He's expecting wine, and I'm going to give him water. Now, did it say anything about anybody being drunk at his wedding? No. Wine, the word that's translated wine in our King James Version here, out of the Latin and the Greek Septuagint, and that's where King James came from. It can mean anything from alcoholic wine, you know, that's fermented, to jelly, and anything in between. Does this mean that every time they had wine in the Bible, that it was alcohol of wine? No, it doesn't. And a lot of times, I mean, they drank wine. As a matter of fact, our uh, missionaries in France and different other places drink wine rather than drinking water. Or they have in the past. You know why they do that? It's better for them. It's better for them. The, the water is not good enough. Yeah, the water's not purified quite like it is in our country here today. They don't have the water purification systems. But that doesn't mean that it has to be alcoholic wine. Grape juice works, right? I mean, you can drink grape juice and it would be just as good for you. As a matter of fact, grape juice is an anti... Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the word, I couldn't say it. But it helps you. It's good for your body. I like to drink it, but um, it's got a lot of sugar in it. <laughs> so I have to be careful with that. Okay, but anyway, so don't just automatically think that this is alcoholic wine. And even at that, they tell me, and I'm just going by what the history books tell me, that the wine that they had back in that day wasn't as uh, high an alcoholic content as what it is today. Okay? So, don't get tripped up there. Now, the phrase that we're honing in today is what? Honing in on. What phrase are we honing in on? In the Bible. question? What phrase in this scripture are we honing in on and going to talk about today? It's the title of the sermon. My hour is not yet come, or my time has not yet come. Okay, my hour has not come. Okay? It's not here yet. So what we've got to understand, and what I want to get across to you here, this hour that it's talking about ties into what we talked about last week when I talked about your cross. Take up your cross and follow me. Now what did Jesus mean by that when he talked to us? What are we supposed to take up? What is our cross? 
That's what our ministry is. What he's given us to do. Okay? So when Jesus said this to Mary, his hour was not yet come. What did Jesus come into the world to do? To die for us. To pay the sin debt. Did he do a lot of other things? Yes. Oh yeah, he did. And that ties into it too. Let's go down through the book of John and look about at the places that Jesus talked about his cross. Okay, or, or his hour, excuse me, not his cross, but his hour. Uh, go over to John chapter 7 and look with me at uh, verse 30. Okay, prior to this, uh, Jesus is uh, teaching in the temple, and he is uh, sharing and beginning to share about the fact that he is God. You know, he sort of saved that a little later in his ministry before he actually come out and said that I am the water, okay, or I am God. Uh, so he was sort of giving them an inkling of that here, and he made uh, comment in, in seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. Uh, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in the Jewry. What's the Jewry? Does that mean war rings and necklaces? And, yeah. in, among the Israelites, uh, the Israelites proper, the scribes and Pharisees. In other words, he was skirting them. Uh, he's still early on in his ministry here. He's not right in front, but he's early on. And he wouldn't walk much among the leaders, okay? They sought him out, as we're going to see here in a minute. But he didn't walk much among them because the Jews, the leaders of the Jews, sought to do what? Kill him, okay? And that gives the flavor of what we've got coming in here. Uh, in verse 25, Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? kill? Okay. But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Now, when the Jews said Christ, what's another word they could have used there? What's another name they could have, might have used? Messiah. Messiah. That's who they were looking for. The Christ is the Messiah. Okay? The Messiah is Christ. You can use them interchangeably. Do the leaders really know that this is the promised one that God was going to send to redeem us, to bring us out? Howbeit we know this man and whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man will know whence he is. Oh boy, that's double talking. This is Jesus. I mean, he's a good prophet, he's a good teacher, he knows his stuff, but he's Joseph's son. He's Joseph and Mary's son. You know, he, John's brother and James's brother. It, it, no, he's, we know who he is, you know. And yet the scripture, the Old Testament scripture tells us that whenever the Messiah comes, we won't know who he is. Okay? Now, quiz time. Okay? Go all the way back to the first and second messages in the book of John here. Okay? Why did they not know he was the Messiah? Why did they know him as a human, but didn't know him as the Messiah? Back up to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word of God, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. What is the light of men? What, did I, what word did I use back that time? 
And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended Logos. it not. What's the word? Logos. Logos is the word of God, right? That's Jesus. The light of God is perception. Okay? How we perceive. You remember it now? Yeah. How do we perceive? And whenever we're born again, whenever we come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we perceive, we know, we understand things differently, right? So here they are, they know Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. Their perception isn't right, okay? Now you've got to understand too that even his brothers and his sisters didn't accept him as the Messiah. They didn't know him until after he died and rose again. Then they accepted Christ, his work, his Messiahship, if I can say that, and they became born again children of God. Okay? Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know, what's that little word next? Not. not. You don't know God. You're not born again. You're not a saved person. So you don't know God. You don't know me. Okay? But I am him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. So in other words, he's speaking a little bit in the middle here. And anyone that truly believed on Jesus Christ as Messiah understood what he said. But those that didn't know him as Messiah didn't understand what he's talking about. It's the same way with this book right here today. If a person is not a born-again child of God, they cannot understand the principles of this book. And there are preachers that are unsaved, and they preach out of this book and use Scripture out of this book, but they don't know what they're talking about. That's why we have to try the prophets. That's why we've got to be careful who we listen to. Okay? Who it is we listen to. When they sought to take him, okay? Now remember, they're seeking to kill him. He's preaching. He's saying, I am from God. I am the Messiah. And they want to kill him, okay? When they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour had not come. What was the cross? What was the mission of Jesus to die on the cross of Calvary? But it wasn't time right here. Okay? So God would not let anything happen. And what a promise we have from God. If we have not fulfilled the mission that God has for us, the purpose that God has for us, or all the purposes that God has for us, if we haven't fulfilled them, there's nobody, no one can touch us. You realize that? Does that mean I'll never get sick? No, no. Because sickness came in by what? Sin. And sin is ruling in this world. And there are times that God will allow uh, sickness or, or, un or to be unhealthy come upon you. And he'll use that in your life. And that ties into where we're going to be faithful. Okay, I promise you that in Sunday school. We are to be faithful. Okay, then go over to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And we're looking at my hour has not come. 23, 12, 23. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew, Philip, tell Jesus. And Jesus answered, saying, The hour is what? Okay, my time has not come. Jesus wasn't taken because it wasn't his hour. But now in chapter 12, and we're moving along in the ministry of Christ, okay? In other words, we're not uh, back at the beginning. We're not at the first quarter, but we're getting along halfway and beyond of Jesus' 
walk in this world. So here he tells Philip and Andrew, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be what? Glorified. Glorified. So, what's he talking about? He came to pay the sin debt in the world. He came for the purpose of the cross of Calvary, the tomb, and the resurrection. Okay? He will be glorified because he glorifies the Father in being obedient. Remember that word I mentioned it earlier. In other words, the people that were filling the water pots were obedient. Jesus is obedient to his call. And then he goes into an explanation here. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, and abide it alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that uh, hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Okay, Jesus is saying, I have to die. Okay? And that's my mission in this world. And I am going to be faithful to God. Now, if you want to be faithful to Jesus, then you do the same thing. You follow after what he has given you to do. And you remember the challenge I gave you last week? What was it you need to know? What your gifts are and what else? What your talents What your talents what your what God has put you here for. Okay? What's your purpose? Not just one. Yeah, Jesus did a lot of other things going to the cross. But you have a purpose. We don't always know what it is. And ultimately God's going to fulfill that purpose. You know what he's going to do when he finally gets down to the main purpose in your life? There you go. Time to go home. Job's done. But you've got a lot of purposes between now and then. Just like Jesus had here. The hour is coming. Go on over to chapter 13. And we'll begin at the uh, chapter 1, our verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, Okay, back over here, the hour is come. We're pretty close here. Chapter 13, the hour was come. That he should depart out of this world into the Father, and having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And the supper being ended, the devil having put in the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that all the Father had given him all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments, and he took a towel and girded himself. And what's he going to do now? Wash feet. He's going to wash the disciples' feet. He is going to give his disciples a summation of all he's been teaching them for three years. Okay? His apostles, basically, because that's who was at the Last Supper there, the apostles. Now, who all's feet, how many men's feet did he wash? Twelve. He washed you his feet, even knowing that he was a dead He was the, uh, the apostate, okay? He knew it, but he showed love to him. That ties in with what we was talking about downstairs in the basement there. You know, when God gives us people to minister to, we can't choose, you know, the personalities, their characters, their, you know, uh, social status. Who God sends, we love, okay? 
But he here was teaching and emphasizing to his apostles because he knew that he was going to leave them for a while. Okay? And he told them that. So he, he was emphasizing these things. And then turn over to chapter 17. Look at verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted his eyes to heaven. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, also that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou, pardon? I'm thinking, said, I think he said, you glorify me. When we say, well, find thy father. Yeah, thee. It's thee and you are the same thing. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth, and I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I'm going to stop right there. Okay, the hour of Jesus Christ was the cross, the tomb, the resurrection. Okay? But he was faithful getting there through childhood, through teenage years, through the early years of adulthood. At the age of 30, he came out and he came to gather his disciples and to do miracles, you know, and to do these things. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we too have a purpose. God has got a purpose for each and every one of us. Do we have to sit around and wait till that time comes? Did Jesus just find him a shade tree and sit under it until the cross? No. He fulfilled what he had to do and what he was directed to do until that time. How did he know to do that? How did he get to the wilderness when he went to the wilderness for temptation? What took him into the wilderness? The Holy Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. Where is the Holy Spirit at the moment that you accepted Christ? Where did he come to? He's in here. And that's what he's there for is to guide us into what God would have us do. That means moment by moment, day by day, decision by decision, then I am being faithful to God, living by the way He tells me to, learning every day, taking off the old man, putting on the new man, becoming who He would have me to be, and ministering as I go along. I'm not just sitting waiting on that big deal. Now folks, there's a lot of people that have come into this world and accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, who were born in obscurity, they lived in obscurity, and they died in obscurity. That means that very few people knew about them. Okay? Maybe their family, maybe a few friends. But they had a purpose and they fulfilled the purpose that God gave them to do. Okay? All of them aren't in the Bible. You know, all of them aren't always remembered. But every one of them that were faithful to God and to do the things that God told them to do throughout their life and to grow in Him, they accomplished God's will in their life. And God used every one of them. I want to bring one to mind before we close out this morning. And that's a man named Moses. Okay? Because a lot of times we think about Moses. Oh, he was a great man. He led the children of Israel out of bondage, you know. Well, did you know he was 80 years old before he led the children out of bondage? In Exodus 2.2, Moses was born. Okay? There's a degree that you know, all the male children was to be killed. Well, his mama had his, uh, her daughter, his sister, put him in a little basket and put him out in the bulrushes there. In uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15 of Exodus, Moses was 40 years old. Boy, he grew a whole lot within one chapter, didn't he? He was 40 years old 
whenever he killed that Egyptian because they were mistreating the Israelites and he went to Midian. How long did he stay in the wilderness of Midian? 40 years. Okay, went out there, got married, had children, built up a, a pretty good sized uh, flock of cattle and, and uh, donkeys and camels. And so in Exodus 3, chapter 1, all the way through Exodus 12, and chapter 10, verse 30, you see him in Midian, and he's growing there. Well, right before he turned 80 years of age, and that was in verse uh, 30, 31 of chapter 12, uh, God brought him before a burning bush, and he challenged him. For that purpose. Now what had God been doing in Egypt when he raised him as a prince of Egypt? And what was he doing when he had him on the backside of the desert uh, and married and having children and feeding flocks and guiding the flocks around? He was preparing him. Okay? How could he stand and talk intelligently with Pharaoh when he had to? because he had been brought up for almost 40 years as a prince of Egypt. How did he know how to lead the children of Israel through the wilderness to Jordan, okay? And then whenever they refused to go across because they were unbelieving, for 40 years they wandered around and he knew where to take them. Over 500,000 people, maybe 750,000. How did he know to do that? Because for 40 years, he led the flocks around to feeding grounds and water, and he cared. God was preparing him, okay? So your hour has not yet come, but God is preparing you if you're listening and if you're following what he tells you to do and you're developing, okay? And then finally, if you go all the way down to Exodus chapter 12 through chapter 33, or chapter 12, 31, the last verse, down through 33, you get all those years that God was wandering <coughs> through the wilderness, okay? Now, he sinned against God. His pride got in his way. And God said, you can't go into the promised land. It was time for them to go to the promised land. He passed the man along to Joshua, and he would lead them across uh, the Jordan and into the promised land and do all the conquering that was to be done there. But at 120 years old, Jesus, Moses died. Okay? Moses died. Did we ever see Moses after that in the Bible? At the mount of what? Mount of Olives, which is the Mount of Ascension, okay, Resurrection. Uh, he took his disciples, or some of them up, and allowed him to see him in his glory. And Moses and Elijah met with him. So we saw Moses back from heaven, the evil of Jesus. Jesus in his glory, in his glorified body, and we're able to see him that way. And Moses and Elijah with him, okay? Okay, what I want you to take away from this, I've said it half a dozen times, you've got a purpose in this world. You have an hour, okay? But while you're going to that hour, we've got a lot of other stuff to learn and to do. We've got to do it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 1 and 2, go ahead and turn to that with me. With me. Let's look at it. Paul says, 412. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ. Oh, he's just talking preachers, right? No, no. Who are the ministers? We all are. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. You have got the mysteries of God in your learning and understanding the principle of the Word of 
God. And whenever God needs for someone you come in contact with to know about Him, know about life, know about what it means to be saved, you've got it. Right? Moreover, it is required in stewards. Now, what's a steward? A keeper. Some, a caretaker. Somebody takes care of someone else's goods. We are taking care of God's goods. What goods are we taking care of? He told us the mysteries. You've got the mysteries. You're a steward over the mysteries. So it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithful. In Hebrews 6, if you read verses 1 through 6, once again it says that we are to be found faithful. Another word that I wrote down I wanted to attribute to that was diligence. To be faithful, to be diligent. Okay? As we go along through life, adding God's love and mercy and grace and all that He bestows upon us to those around us so that they might come to know Jesus as their personal Savior and then that they may start to grow and develop and become the people that God would have them. Okay? And we all do it different. Okay? We do it through groups we meet with whenever we're just chatting one on one. We do it whenever someone that we know has a a heartbreak, maybe it's loss of a loved one or loss of a job or a financial problem, and we talk with them. We're sharing the love, the word, the principle of the word of God. You know, people will ask you things that you won't know the answer to. But you know a man. You know a God man that has the answer. Okay? Father, we thank you for for working in to us and for allowing us to be a part of your work and will, to be a steward for you. Lord, find us faithful. Help us to be faithful to you. Now, Father, as we go from this place, help us to touch the lives of others and break our heart for the lost and for the way that are saved, those that are saved but not broken, that we might share. For I pray in Jesus' name.